The title of today's message is the King's Inaugural Address, okay? Now, I've never really been into politics. It's never really been my thing. It's like people start talking about it. I'm the guy that literally walks away. And they ask me my opinion, I'll take the Twix and put it, you know what I mean? I just, I don't, I'm, I don't feel like I'm informed enough. And you guys can, can cast stones at me later. That's okay. I just, it's, it's kind of boring to me. I, I know, but it's your few, I, I know, I know, I get it. Trust me, I should be more involved. I should know more. I just don't. I'm sorry, just not really interested. That is, but that's me. I'm not saying it has to be you. I've never really been into politics, and I slept through most of my American history class. I'm not proud of that. That's not something, I promise you, I'm not proud of it. It's just, it was super boring. They put on uh, episodes of the West Wing, and I was just like, knock out. Like, I just did not care. But now as I'm older, now I'm like starting to kind of, you hear a lot more, and you're starting to pay a little bit more attention. And when I got the title for today's message and the passage I was going to be preaching on, um, I said, you know, well, uh, inaugural address, what is that? Like, I know it's something the president does, like when they come to power, right? And it's like they have to say something. And so they have, they give a speech. But what, what, what do they talk about? What do they say? I don't know. So I started going to Google and I'm like, what inaugural speeches? And I'm like reading stuff. John F. Kennedy's, the shortest one by far. And it was like super impactful. I was like, let's go, John F. Kennedy. <laughs> I would have, man, shoot, 1960, I would have, yes, sir, John F. Kennedy, he's the one. Because it was short, it was sweet to the point. He's like, let's get on with it. Let's, let's go ahead and run this country, right? The purpose of an inaugural address is for a president to present their vision for the country they'll be leading and to set goals for their nation. A good inaugural address would give people hope for the future of their country, that's what a good inaugural address will do. A lot of times they mention the condition of the country and how the, the, what, what led the country to where it is. And the, the president will then say, hey, here's the direction I'm going to take it in, though. All right, I'm going to be taking the, direction, the country in a direction that hopefully will be better than what we were in the past. That, that's what a good inaugural address would do, right? It, it gives hope. And it, it gives hope in, in the future of the country, and it gives hope in the future of our leaders, right? It'll say, this, this leader might be doing something good. Let's see, hopefully. Right? Ultimately, we know, though, those of us that follow Jesus Christ, we know that he is the ultimate leader. Everything is in his hands and his control. Nothing happens without his say-so. We may question why things happen, but ultimately, he is the greatest leader. So this morning, we're going to start looking at the beginning of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, specifically the Beatitudes, which serves as a kind of an intro to his inaugural address, all right? The, the Sermon on the Mount is five to, uh, chapters 5 to 7 in the book of Matthew. Um, it's relatively long if you look at it as, in terms of, of a sermon, but it's actually kind of short as well. He gets really to the point. And the whole thing is that a new kingdom is being formed, and Jesus is its king. This kingdom and its king are the one who have been prophesied about, promised, and waited on for centuries. And for centuries, the Israelites have been waiting for the Messiah, the anointed one, the one that would deliver them from their oppressors and establish a new reign with them as its citizens, where they'll be blessed forever. However, this new kingdom that Jesus is going to start presenting isn't exactly what was expected. It's an upside-down kingdom. It doesn't really make sense when you look at it from the world's point of view. See, Jesus sees a crowd. He goes up to the mountain and he sits down and begins to teach. Now, before we start getting into the passage, I want you guys to go ahead and pray with me, if you will. Lord Jesus, this morning we just come before you asking you to speak. Lord, your words are eternal. Your words were relevant then, they'll be relevant now, and they'll be relevant forevermore. And I just ask you, Lord Jesus, that you speak these words of eternity into our minds and hearts. That, Father, we are transformed by them, that we understand who we belong to, what you've called us out from, and what you've called us to do. Speak powerfully and mightily through your word this morning with your truth. I ask you to cut out all distraction, Lord. 
so that we can focus wholeheartedly on what you want us to know so that we don't leave the same way we walked in through these doors, but we are transformed through your word and your Holy Spirit. And Lord Jesus, I ask that your Holy Spirit take complete control of me to deliver your message the way you want me to, Father. Let me not say anything that is out of line. Let me not say anything that you have not ordained me to say, Father. But be in complete control of my mouth and my mind as I preach your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So, in ancient times and during this time, and still to this day, rabbis, whenever they, they, whenever they would go teach, what they would do is they sit down. And everybody else would sit down and they just start this discourse. They start this conversation. And so Jesus goes up to this mountain and he sees this crowd. He goes up to the mountain and he has a seat. It's kind of reminiscent of, of Moses going up to the mountain and coming down with authority to speak. Well, Jesus goes up to the mountain and he speaks to them with authority. So everyone sits down and he gets ready to speak. And the first word that he says is blessed. The main idea for today, the big idea for today is that Jesus presents the vision and he sets the expectation of what it means to be a citizen of his kingdom. What it means to be a citizen of his kingdom. So he says that first word, blessed. The word blessed gets tossed around a lot these days. And generally speaking, we use it to refer to someone who is doing well according to how society views doing well. All right? Someone who has a lot of stuff, they're super comfortable. It might be somebody you aspire to be like in the future. Man, I want to be blessed like that person. They, they need something, they got it. They go somewhere, they, they plan it out, and it happens that way. That person is blessed. Maybe they have their family all buttoned up and they look cute together and they wear matching outfits, right? I want to be like them. I want to be blessed like that. And maybe their kids listen when they say, no, it's not the case for me, right? Maybe their kids are just like, they're just super cute and they're super charismatic. Like Whatever the case may be, however you may view the word of somebody being blessed, a lot of times we see that as a physical appearance or material things. But that's not how the word blessed is used here. The word blessed in this case can be translated as happiness, as bliss, what many would consider the good life. The Greek word here, you have to understand that the New Testament was written in Greek, okay? So the Greek word here would be makairos. It's a, it's a happiness that isn't brought on by external circumstances. It's not, I hit the lotto, I'm happy. It's not, I bought a new pair of shoes, I'm happy. It's not, my car smells really nice, I'm happy, right? It's not brought on by external circumstances, right? It's something that is internal. It's an internal happiness, completely content in yourself. So nothing can shake that happiness. Nothing can, can move you out of that happy state. Right? That's makairos. The Hebrew word that most closely represents this word makairos would be asher. Anybody have a friend or know somebody named asher? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, a, it's a popular name. It's a common name, right? So asher, asher is a happiness that defines something like the good life. The good life. So here's the good life, right? People who live by the beach and they can go whenever they want, that to me would be Asher, all right? Somebody who can eat a ton of food and not gain a pound, that's Asher, all right? Somebody who could go in their closet and put on anything and still look really cool, that's Asher. Like, I can't do that. Like, I can't walk around. People will just look at me like I'm crazy. Some people just have that, that skill. That's Asher. That's the good life. So when we moved here from Texas, um, my son JJ, he's four. We, we took him to the beach one day. We go to the beach a lot. We try to go to the beach as much as we can. Um, and so JJ goes, and he's playing in the sand. And he leans back in the sand. He kicks back. He puts his hands behind his head. And he goes, ah, this is the life. And I'm looking at this kid. I'm like, boy, what do you know about the life? That's Asher. That's, that, that's the good life. He's like, this is living. Like, I tell him we're going to the beach, and he knows that's the life. However, we're going to go see, look at verses 3 through 5. And Jesus is going to talk about the state of the kingdom and how Jesus finds us in the kingdom. And the blessings that he's going to be talking about don't exactly look like blessings in the eyes of the world. 
At least not in verses three through five. The truth is, Jesus finds us in a very terrible situation. The state of the union is terrible, it's bad. And we need to fix it, we need to do something about it. So this king is now coming into this new kingdom and he is giving his inaugural speech. So he starts out with saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. That's verse three, blessed are the, king, the poor in spirit for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Now, let me explain what the poor in spirit is. The poor in spirit are those who lack power. They lack vitality. They're completely powerless. They're an uncharged iPhone, right? It's just a black screen. They're unable to do anything because they lack the resources necessary to do anything. This can mean, materially speaking, like I don't have enough money to change anything, right? I, I would love to do something, but I can't. So materially, I have nothing. It's, it's where you see the poor and, and how the poverty around you and you're not, you see the poverty around you and you're not able to do anything about it. That's, that's, a, that's a terrible situation to be in. Poor and not being able to change anything or do anything about it. You're powerless. But it also means lacking or not having enough spiritually. We, spiritually, we don't have the resources to pay for our sinful nature. We're spiritually poor and we can't pay to get into the right relationship with God. I can't pay monetarily because what can I give God that he doesn't already have? I can't pay with my efforts. I can't pay with my good works because how good is good enough? I'm still going to fall short. But what Jesus says is this is a good thing. This is the good life. If you're poor in spirit, that's a good life. How is that a good life? How is this a good thing? Because when you recognize your state of poverty, and in that recognition, you realize that the second part of that verse applies to you. We get to be a part of a new kingdom. See, the kingdom of God has come near. This is Jesus. And the first step in repentance and understanding my terrible state is turning around and going in a new direction. That's what repentance means, turn. And that new direction starts on a path of poverty. I have nothing. I recognize I have nothing. Poverty in spirit. But we know that we're on a path to this new kingdom and we're not by ourselves because we're walking with the king, King Jesus. We live in a world that sees the good life as those who hustle and they grind and they have stuff because they work for it. We tend to value people who pull themselves up by their own bootstraps, right? Well, you get to a point when you don't even have enough ax to grind. There's nothing to grind with. You're poor in spirit. You got nothing. Jesus is saying here that the good life is for the poor who are on their knees, open-handed with nothing, because then they're ready to take hold of the kingdom of heaven. When you come before Jesus recognizing that we are poor in spirit, all you have is open hands with nothing in them to grab hold of what Jesus is offering. And it's not material goods. A material good can't solve a spiritual problem. I can't put a bandage on a wounded heart. It doesn't work that way. Which leads us to verse 2. I'm sorry, verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. See, he's saying that the good life belongs to those who are in a state of mourning. Well, what are we mourning? It could be that we're actually mourning over actual death that we see around us. The loss of loved ones. You grieve and you mourn that. But it could also be the mourning over the state of the world, what it is that we see happening around us, the death, the destruction, the downfall, where we are right now. I hear it all the time, man, we're, this world is going down the drain and the United States and this and that. And that's a sense of mourning. Something is not right. And we are mourning that. We are grieving that. But Jesus is also referring to mourning over our spiritual and emotional loss as a result of our sin. Not only our sin, but sins against us. That's painful. I don't know about you, but I know it's happened to me. I've been sinned against, and it hurts. But I also know that I've sinned against others. And that should be painful to me. I should be in a state of mourning and grief because of that. And Jesus is saying this is the good life, though. 
How is this the good life? Because those who mourn over death, over destruction, over poverty, over the state of our world and the state of our sin will be comforted. Jesus is going back into the saying of the prophets. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 and 2 says, Comfort, comfort my people, says our God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and announce to her that her time of hard service is over. Her iniquity has been pardoned, and she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Jesus is going back and quoting Isaiah, which would have been a very known prophet during that time. To find comfort after grief means you experience a new or restored life after a long period of grief. So I'm going to receive comfort. When I was a kid, I used to cry a lot. Like, I was a big old crybaby, man. My uh, my kindergarten, I remember this, my kindergarten teacher, Ms. Rattler, I didn't know. So my name is Will, William. My, My dad's name is William, too, but my middle name is Stephen. And my family would call me Stephen for us not to get confused. Right. So they call my dad William and they call me Stephen. So I grew up thinking I'm Stephen. So I go to kindergarten and my teacher's calling me William, William, William. And I'm not answering. William, William. And she gets in my face and she shouts, William. I start crying. And I was an ugly cry. I still am to this day. So I'm crying, I'm crying, I'm crying, crying, crying. And I remember, man, kindergarten. I, I will never forget Michelle, a girl that I met. I, knew, I didn't know her name then, but I knew later. Michelle's rubbing my back. It's okay. Five years old. It's okay. Man, that was comforting, but it made me cry even more. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, stop it, man. Leave me alone. Let me just cry. Sometimes over a long period of grief, you just need some comfort. And Jesus, in his new kingdom, he's ushering in a comfort that has never before been seen. Jesus is talking about a comfort that is everlasting in his everlasting kingdom. It's not going to be a temporary comfort or rub on the back there, there, it'll be okay. It's an everlasting comfort where every tear will be wiped from your eye for all of eternity. Verse 5 says that blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. When we come before Jesus, we are meek. We are humble. The humble are those who are considered unimportant. It's not be humble like I am humble and read my book on how to be humble like me. That's not that type of humility. It's, It's being humble in the sense that I am considered unimportant. See, the people that Jesus was, t- was talking to in the hillside of, of Galilee, they were unimportant people to the rest of society. So when he says, hey, blessed are the humble, he is speaking directly to them. They're considered people that have no type of influence around the circle of the society that they're in. It's people that have been being taken advantage of by the wicked, those being oppressed and mistreated. Job 24 verses 1 through 4 says this, Why does the Almighty not reserve times for judgment? Why do those who know him never see his days? The wicked displace boundary markers. They steal a flock and provide pasture for it. They drive away the donkeys owned by the fatherless, and they take the widow's ox as collateral. They push the needy off the road. The poor of the land are forced into hiding. That is is a gross injustice. An orphan, right, who who has his, his donkey, And somebody just comes and takes it and says, no, the donkey is mine now. That's that's bullying if I've never seen it before in my life, right? Or or taking a widow's ox that is used to actually make money. That's an injustice. These are the humble. These are the meek that Jesus is talking about. The orphans, the widows, the poor. These are the people that have been mistreated over time that we can see the mistreatment happening. People who have done wrong against them, similar to the poor in spirit, uh, have wrong done against them, I'm sorry, similar to the people that are poor in spirit, they're going to inherit the land. Having land or inheriting land was the primary way to make money in this culture, right? It was an agrarian culture, so they farmed and they had cattle, so they needed land to be able to do this. And typically, the more land you have, the more crops you would have and the more uh, cattle you could, could have, which would in turn make you money, right? But these people are poor. They have nothing. Many times they're working. This is the crazy thing about it. Many times these people that he's talking to were working for people who had taken their land from them. 
This is, it's a gross injustice. It's mistreatment, right? But Jesus is also quoting from Psalm 37, 7 through 11. He says, be silent before the Lord and wait expectantly for him. Do not be agitated by one who prospers in his way, by the person who carries out evil plans. Refrain from anger and give up your rage. Do not be agitated. It can only bring harm, for evildoers will be destroyed. But those who put their hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while, and the wicked person will be no more. Though you look for him, he won't be there. But the humble will inherit the land and will enjoy abundant prosperity. Now, the people that Jesus is talking to, they're saying abundant prosperity. Yes, I want money. I want that. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is saying this situation, being humble, is the good life because it belongs to those that are unimportant, those who are outside the circles of influence. When you're humble enough to trust God, you're humble enough to understand that he's going to direct all outcomes, all events. Anything that is happening around us, we can trust that not in the power of our own strength, but that God will make everything right. Not just the injustices that were done against me, but more importantly, the injustices that I've done against others. God is going to make that right. <clears throat> and we know that the kingdom of God will be the ultimate land inheritance. But wait, there's more. Jesus just doesn't leave us there. Verses 6 through 8, he shows us the type of people God is forming us to be in his kingdom. So he finds us in, he finds us in this state. We're poor in spirit. We're mourning. We're humble. We're unimportant. But now we come to Jesus and say, I'm recognizing that I'm that. I've repented. I'm turning in a new direction. What now? Well, now Jesus starts forming, transforming our hearts. Okay, let's look at verse six. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. He's forming us to be a people who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What righteousness means is people who hunger and thirst for a right relationship. The good life belongs to those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. This means that we're people who treat each other rightly. And it's, it's this picture People who lack, people who are hungry, people who are thirsty, they're aware that they're starving for righteousness. Okay? Anybody uh, parent a 13 or 12 to 14 year old boy? Anybody? Okay, check this out. Okay? When I was about 14 years old, I ate like a bottomless pit. Like I, it, you could not fill me up. Like it was not possible, right? So my mom and dad were separated and I'd go visit my mom on the weekends. And 14 years old, I'd wake up in the morning and I'd eat the leftovers from the night before. That was my snack. And then I just continue eating throughout the day. My mom came to me one day and she's like, listen, I love you, son, but you can't keep spending the night. And I was hurt, man. I was hurt. I was like, what? How come, man, my mom don't want me at all. You know, I went through the whole sob story. Later on, I understood my mom was raising two of my other brothers on her own. And I was eating up all her food. She just couldn't afford to have me there. Okay? But I was just hungry. I had no explanation for it. I just knew I needed to fill my body with more and more food. Okay? What Jesus is doing in our hearts, he is making us a people who are hungry for righteousness. When we see wrongdoing, when we see people who are not getting along, we want to step in and fix it, right? We want to fix it we, because we're thirsty and hungry for that, okay? Hungry teenagers are a great illustration for people who are hungry for righteousness. This is what God is doing. People think that righteousness is being pure and being good, not having any type of flaws before God. But that's not what this verse is saying at all. It's actually talking about the character of someone being in a right relationship with other people. The type of person that God is making us to be is one who hungers for relationships to be made right. Listen, when we do right by each other, we're coming into the fullness of life. And so are the people who we're doing right by. When there's broken relationships around us, we're seeking to make it right. We need to make it right. 
First and foremost, we see people who are, don't have a right relationship with God, and we're telling them about Jesus so they can make a right relationship with God. That's, that should be a desire that we thirst and hunger for. He's also making us a people who show mercy because we will be shown mercy, like it says in verse 7. Okay? Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Mercy here is very specific. It means forgiving someone who has wronged you and owes you a debt. Now, the word forgiveness means that I'm not going to, even when I have an opportunity to get paid back, I won't do it. Mercy for us can sometimes have an association with doing something wrong. Sort of like, Jesus, I messed up. Please forgive me. Please have mercy on me. But in reality, it's more like, Jesus, you don't owe me, but you could, could you please do me this kindness? Please treat me like you would a close family member. Go over and above and showing me kindness. See, many of us have family members. We have close friends. We have associates that we might consider friends. And we, have, we know strangers. Right? What Jesus is saying is that citizens of this new kingdom that he is ushering in are being formed to go over and above what we do for anyone and treat everyone like close family with loving kindness. That's the type of mercy he wants us to show. This is the message of Jesus when he says that all the law of prophets boil down to this, love God and love neighbor. He wants us to go over and above showing loving kindness. The good life belongs to those who are merciful, those who show loving kindness. He's also creating us to be a people who are pure in heart because we will see God. To be pure in heart means that from the outside, what people see me doing right, when people see me doing right by others, it matches exactly what's going on inside. See, it's, it's easy to fake the funk. It's so easy to fake the funk. I did it for years. Uh, matter of fact, so check this out. Um, the church that I, I was a part of when I was growing up, I was like 19, and they had me running sound. So uh, sometimes when, when I would get in trouble, they would be like, I used to play drums at that church too, and they'd be like, hey, you can't play, you're in trouble, go do something else. And it's like, okay, so I'd run sound because like, I could hide out in the sound booth and like, go online or whatever. And, um, but what was cool about running sound is that you put the headphones on and I can isolate like, different things. Like I could isolate the, the guitar, I can isolate um, the piano. I can, and one of my favorite things to do was isolate the singers and see how off key they were, right? <laughs> And then, like, I'd sit there and I'd be like, yo, they're so bad. Like, listen, listen. I'd talk to my friend, like, yo, listen, listen. It, it was, I, was, I was not the best influence. I wouldn't say hang out, have your kids hang out with me back then. Um, but here's the craziest thing about it, right? Sometimes I'd see somebody up there, and they'd be holding a mic, and they'd be praising, and, they'd, and I'd isolate the voice, and nothing was coming out. Like, they're not singing. Like, and I'd be like, you're not even singing. You're faking it. Like, what are you, what is this? Like, you're not, there's nothing, what are you, you're cheating. Like, that's not right. But it's easy to do that. People could look at that and say, wow, how spiritual. Well, people can look at you and see you give a bunch of money and say, wow, how spiritual. But they're not seeing your heart, right? A person who is pure in heart, it matches. Like, what I'm giving is because I want to see good done with it. What I'm doing matches my desire to honor God with what I'm doing. That's pure in heart, right? It's not, it's not hey, I'm reading my Bible. Let me take a picture and post it on the gram. Like, that, that's not pure in heart. Pure in heart says I'm going to read this, know it, and apply it to my life, and you're going to see my life be different. That's pure in heart, right? Pure in heart is not let me watch my language. I'm around my church folk, and then when I go around my friends, I'm going to just speak however I want. That's not pure in heart. It's not matching up. Jesus is saying that when you're pure in heart, you're not faking it. But God is making us pure in heart. The psalmist uh, in, verse in chapter 24, verses three, five, 3 through 5, he says, Who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not appealed to what is false, but he, or what, ha what he's sworn, what he's not sworn deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from God of his salvation. So like the psalmist, we're being, our hearts are being made pure. We recognize our need for a pure heart. And God is creating that in us. 
And then we'll be able to see him in the land that we inherit, the kingdom of God. So what do we do with this knowledge of God? What do we do with this? Right? It's like the man who goes and works out every day, six days a week. Well, no, not every day. Six days a week, he needs Sunday to rest, right? And he gets these swole muscles, right? And then you see in this bodybuilder dude, and you're like, yo, man, what you do with all those muscles? Watch, I'm going to show you. Takes off his shirt, and he just starts flexing. Right? And it's like, that's cute, but what else? Like, you know, <laughs> all right, like a little, but look at that tricep. Look at that. You see that? Like, but what do you do with that? Like, nothing. I just flex. Like, that's a loss. What a waste of space. Like, put it to use. Like, put some bags around or something. Like, hold my groceries. Like, you know? It's a waste if you don't do anything with it. So, so Jesus finds us in our terrible situation. He starts transforming us. We don't just sit there and say, yes, man, look, God is so awesome. Look how awesome he is. He has saved me. Let me sit here and just enjoy a message and sing some songs. That is not how this works. Verse, uh, verse 9 says that blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. He asks us to be peacemakers. Peace doers. It's a verb. Peace has to be made. Here's how, it's, how, the, how this works. You got to get ready to be involved in arenas of conflict. You got to get ready to join the fight. It's not about avoiding conflict, but being present in the conflict so that we can present Jesus as a solution to the problem. It's like you got two, two friends that are fighting. You don't want them to fight. So you jump in the middle. You, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, hey, remember, we're We're friends. We, we got we to gotta be amicable here. We're, we're jumping in the arena with them. We're not saying, oh, fight, 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 fight. Go ahead, go after it. Like, no, we're peacemakers. We got to jump in. We don't say, well, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a man of peace. I'm going to let y'all figure that out. Be men about it. Like, that, that doesn't work that way. Being a peacemaker says I jump in and I try to offer a solution to the conflict. Well, we have to know that in this new kingdom of Jesus, the solution is Jesus. The conflict is sin, and Jesus is the solution. We're being sinned against, and we are sinning, and we need a solution, and that solution is Jesus. It's what Jesus did for us. Romans 5a says that, but God proves his own love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He was the peacemaker on our behalf. Jesus was and still is the solution to the conflict. Peace needs to be made, and the only way to make peace is to be ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven, ambassadors to the kingdom that we belong to. We're not just lowly old citizens. We're ambassadors, each and every one of us who proclaim Jesus. We are ambassadors to his kingdom, the God of peace who brings us together. When we do this, we're going to be called the sons of God, children of God, because we look like our father. Children tend to look like their parents, right? And I, I hear parents all the time arguing over, like, hey, no, he looks like me. No, when they act bad, oh, that's your kid. That's, that's your son. That's your daughter, right? That, they look just like you. But when they're good, it's, oh, no, that's mine. That's my kid. All the time. Well, when we do good, we're, we're proclaiming God. We're proclaiming Jesus wherever we go. What else do we do with this? What else do we do with this knowledge? Well, verse 10 says that we're persecuted. We're persecuted. Now, that doesn't sound like the good life. It doesn't sound like the good life to be persecuted. No one wants that. No one wants to be ridiculed and chased after. No one likes that. But Jesus says this is going to happen. Guess what? It's a hard road, but it's the right path. You're going to be persecuted when you do what's right according to Jesus. You know, you would think that people who are bringing people together, showing them how to live rightly, will be accepted and appreciated by everyone. But that's not always the case because people don't like to be told that they're wrong. People don't like to be told that they're wrong. You know what that means? If you're wrong, you have to change the way you live. You don't tell me the way I'm living is wrong. Well, Jesus says, I don't care what Jesus says. You're reading it wrong. It's up into interpretation. No, it's not, it doesn't work that way. Let me tell you how you should live according to how Jesus says. Well, I don't like that. So we're going to be persecuted for it. The common thought then, as it is now, is that if you do the right thing, you're going to get the good life. You're going to be blessed. 
What Jesus is saying, though, is that in the upside-down kingdom, you get the good life when you're persecuted for doing what's right according to him. You know, following Jesus doesn't mean you're going to have a whole bunch of people who are going to be around you loving you all the time. On the contrary, a lot of times you're going to find yourself lonely, being the only one proclaiming his truth. And he says, you know what, it's okay, because they did that to the prophets. Matter of fact, they did it to him. And the servant is not above his master. In this chapter, Jesus is given the very beginning of his inaugural address. He is inaugurating a new kingdom that seems nothing like anyone expected and harder than anyone could imagine. But this is the only kingdom worth living for. There's a new kingdom with new people, transformed people. But God never intended to just give his commandments to his people. But his intention was always to create a new people with new hearts, new desires, and new attitudes. That was always his intention. This newness, this new heart, new desires, new attitudes, a new people, this is what Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, and the rest of the prophets were waiting for. They looked forward to a new exodus, a new leading out, a greater and final salvation from sin's power for the people of God. This is what they were waiting for. And Jesus shows up and he's given it to them. When Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near, he is holding before us only two options. These are the only two options we have in this life. It's we could either turn and live a blessed life or the opposite. And the opposite of blessing is a curse. So you can either live a life of blessing or you can live a life of cursing. That is it. There's only two options. There is no in between. There's no, well, I can be kind of good. There's no in between. You live this blessed life where Jesus finds you where you are, transforms you and uses you, or you live a curse where God has nothing to do with you. You choose to leave your heart hard and choose to not be a peacemaker and choose to live life your way. Now, my question for us this morning is, do you have a new heart? Is your, light, is your heart transformed? Is your life evidence of a transformed heart? If it's not, God's judgment hangs over you. That's the truth. Remember, we're poor in spirit. There's nothing we can do to get out of that situation. We need Jesus to pay the bill. And he did. The good news, the gospel, is that it doesn't have to be that way where you have God's judgment hanging over you. You can be a member of the kingdom of God, live a blessed life, and avoid the curse and wrath of God by turning to the King, Jesus Christ, who's already taken the curse and the wrath of God on himself on the cross. He took it completely on himself. Why? So that you can live the good life. Now, the world may look at our life and say, that is not a good life. The world may look at your life and say, you live a life of do's and don'ts, the Ten Commandments. Remember, that was never God's intention. He wants you to live an abundant life full of his blessing. In this upside down kingdom, the blessing may look different than the world thinks is blessed. But ultimately, we inherit the kingdom of God. If we don't live that way, all we inherit is wrath and destruction. You know, Jesus has the power to take everything that has been broken and bring it back together. Whatever is dead, to bring it back to life. And here's what I want us to do. Let's go ahead and close our eyes and bow our heads. I would, be, I would be doing us all a disservice if I don't give people an opportunity to respond to this. Okay. If, if you take nothing away, if you take nothing away from what I spoke about, all I talked about this morning, understand this. Without Jesus, you're lost and dead. With Jesus, you're found and alive. With Jesus, you're giving a, given a new life. You're given a new heart. You're given a new direction to walk in. Without Jesus, you're left to your own devices, which leads to death and destruction. 
A life of blessing may seem like something that's hard, but it's full of joy and true happiness, knowing that we inherit the kingdom of God. Without Jesus, you have temporary happiness, temporary joy that is, that is uh, left up to outside circumstances, but it doesn't last it, 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 for eternity. It doesn't last forever. So I want you right now to examine your heart. Examine yourself. Be honest with yourself. Bring yourself before the cross of Jesus Christ. Examine your heart. Is your heart hard? Do you reject Jesus? Are you rejecting your state? Are you not allowing him to work to make you a citizen of his kingdom? Are you a person who is just sitting down, receiving, and not doing anything with all that you've received? Jesus has called us all to repent. All of us need to turn and go to a new way. If you've never done this, if you've never truly given yourself up to Jesus, if you've just been faking the funk, if you've just been mouthing words and not singing into the microphone of life, now's an opportunity to do this. Now, I'm not asking anybody to come up. I'm not asking anybody to pray a prayer. The Holy Spirit interprets what you say to God the Father. All you have to do is open your heart to him. Come to him with open, empty hands so that you can grab hold of the kingdom of God. If you're making this decision for the first time or you want to make sure that you're going in the right direction, doing the right thing, come find one of us, one of the pastors of the church. Come find one of the deacons, one of the servers, and start telling them about your decision to see what God is going to do. And I'll end with this, with this prayer. Jesus, we come before you understanding that we are dead without you. We are a bunch of tombs. We are a bunch of graves that only you can turn into gardens. Only you can give life to dead bones. And we ask you, Lord Jesus, that you continue to do a work and each and every one of us who are citizens of your kingdom. We know that this is the beginning of where you are going to take us in your message, in your sermon. And I just ask you, Father, that you continue to allow us to go deeper with you. Lord, you called us to righteousness. Righteousness that goes above and beyond the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Above religiousness. Above rules above actions. You've called us to a deep relationship with you, Lord. And I just ask you, Father, that you work in each and every one of our hearts and minds, that you stir us up to the good works that you want us to do. I thank you, Lord, that Radiant City is a church that chooses to proclaim your truth and is about bringing about life change, Lord. Work powerfully and mightily, Father, that we may give testimony and glorify your name, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.